The uh, quicker we go through it, the more quickly you get fed. All right, so hopefully people have their pictures. So, um, yeah, I really want to give a talk about LEDs, but I didn't want to tell John about that, so I made another title that sounded more reasonable, and uh, it worked. Woohoo! Um, so, um, yeah, ESP32. If you remember last year, I had a little outfit with what seemed like a lot of LEDs. It was really only 768 running on ESP8266, which was good enough for then. Uh, but, you know, if you have something, then maybe you should do something better, because otherwise you might be doing something more useful with your time. So that's exactly what I did, uh, which meant that I had to get more pixels, which also meant I need to have a better CPU, which is where ESP32 came in. So um, I got a bunch of uh, NeoPixel strips uh, from a friend who hated me, who gave me 4,096 of them, plus a few spares. So I had to do something with them, which is what I did. Uh, it took me several weeks of work. Um, was my first prototype on ESP32. It worked. Um, most everything was OK, except one demo that didn't work. And I didn't, didn't know why, and I found out later. Um, so the frame buffer only takes 12 kilobytes. If you can uh, see the quick math in uh, 24 bits per pixel, so that's not really a big deal. Uh, so it all worked. ESP32 is awesome. Great. Um, then we have, um, so if you look at the picture, um, on the left side you have the low resolution NeoPixel matrix, which, which is what I was wearing last year. On the right side you have this little guy here, which is my new outfit. Um, and as you notice, it has a few more pixels on it, uh, pretty much 10 times more, give or take. So that took a bit more memory. Also using those RGB panels, and I don't have much time to go into them, but they're a pain in the rear to drive because you have to constantly refresh them. Uh, there's no such thing as orange. There's red at a certain PWM value plus another one, and you mix it yourself, and you do it quickly enough. Otherwise, uh, when you take a picture, you can see a refresh bar in the middle of the picture and it looks terrible. So long story short is they're cheap. You get a lot of pixels like this, uh, but they're really, uh, inconvenient to run. The other thing is I had all this code that I had uh, either written or borrowed from other people or who some nicely gave me the code. And I didn't want to rewrite uh, that code for a completely different driver backend uh, because, well, you know, the driver is nothing alike. So I took the smart matrix driver that was designed for those RGB panels. I made a uh, a layer on top called Smart Matrix GFX, which then allowed me to run the exact same GFX code that I had before. I also wrote a try API a wrapper for Adafruit, a fast LED, and another API called LED Matrix. So you could have code written against all three APIs running at the same time on the same hardware. And then what I did underneath was to drive, uh, to write different hardware backends. So the same a layer in the middle could now write two different things. So you can see here, again, those, um, those pixels. And then if you see on the side, the exact same thing on a very tiny uh, TFT. Um, and on the left side, left side of the picture, you see some slightly bigger screens. The bigger one, you might recognize this, the screen we had on IOTAS a few years back, which is 320 times 240. So again, the idea is the same code runs on everything multiple APIs, multiple backends. Now, this was good until it wasn't. Um, so if you do some quick math, uh, the TFT is starting to push memory a little bit. But before even getting to that, um, the RGB panel should fit. But the problem is because of how it's uh, driven, you need to pre-compute um, planes, basically PWM planes that are being flashed very quickly. And that's how you get those color mixing. And that means that you need to have multiple copies of your frame buffer for each color component. And that started to, to push the memory a little bit. But I was like, hey, you know, ESP32 spec sheet says right here, 520 kilobytes, so that should be plenty. Um, well, it does have 520-ish, um, but don't actually try to use it all because you won't be able to. Uh, so the first thing I found out was my 320 uh, 240 TFT uh, blew up on the SP32, and I got all kinds of errors. So if you see the quick math, it should only be 225 kilobytes, which should fit easily, but did not. Uh, it worked on Teensy, which had enough memory, and there was actually memory you could use on the SP32, not so much. So 
What's different on ESP32 is you're actually running a task. Um, you don't actually get to use all the memory because it's not contiguous. It's not all the same kind of memory. Some is 8-bit memory. Some is 32-bit memory, uh, which is used for instruction caching and other things. Um, if you have a normal array, you cannot use the 32-bit memory. Uh, there's also memory that's DMA, some that isn't. It's complicated. Um, and just to make things better, which is actually a, a feature on ESP32, you have PS RAM, which is additional RAM you can connect, which is not part of the chip, um, it, which is connected via an external bus. And that memory is still different. But you can have 8 megabytes, which is kind of exciting for a chip of that size. So back to the uh, memory you can actually use. So it says um, 160 is actually, why is it saying slide one? Uh, okay, that's just being stupid. Um, so yeah, the URLs that actually um, aren't small that you can get later. Um, due to technical limitations, as the spec, the spec sheet says, um, a mask, maximum uh, DRM usage is actually 160, and that's where a global array would go in. So really, an array on the SP32 can only be as big as 160 kilobytes in the best case scenario. Um, then you have another 160 kilobytes that you can get via malloc. So that's fine, but again, if your code is already using arrays or you have a library using arrays, that doesn't really help you. Now it gets more complicated than that. Um, I'll just read what it said. <laughs> uh, at runtime, the available heap DRAM may be less, and the maybe means it actually is less. Um, that ha happens because the free RTOS um, that's running underneath is actually using its own memory also, which is fair. And without going into long details here, you can see that uh, the memory is actually in multiple bits, uh, as in little uh, pieces um, of DRAM, IRAM, um, and basically, yeah, it's not contiguous. So I just give a bunch of issues that you can read up more later, otherwise I would be talking for way too long. Uh, of people seeing issues, you'll find that half those issues are actually from me, and half of, probably more than half of them got uh, also answered by Angus, who I uh, thank for his help there. Um, so if you're using way too much memory, like a big global array, you will get this compile time error. Uh, here, which is quite helpful, oops, it just tells you, hey, you know, you overflowed the RAM segment by whatever number of bytes. So that's pretty useful. You're like, well, I should have the memory, but I don't have it, and I know how much I'm overusing. So that's fine. Then, well, oops, let's not do that. Um, now, if you're not lucky and you're using just too much RAM, it will be good at linking time. Um, then all that RAM will go into your global array, and then free RTOS will try to initialize and take some RAM also, except there won't be any left. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of memory left, but not memory that it can actually use. So what happens is your code crashes before it even gets to run. That kind of uh, first time I hit that was a bit uh, okay. Uh, the, merit, the message that you get is not exactly super helpful either. Well, I guess it's helpful if you understand what it means, but I sure didn't. Um, now, the good news, you can Google it, and you'll probably find the two issues that I just gave, um, gave you that hint. The next problem is a uh, stack. So the normal way on very simple uh, CPUs that things happen is you have heap that starts from the bottom, stack that starts from the top, or the other way around, doesn't matter. And heap, as you do mallocs, they grow up, and the stack goes down, and hopefully they never meet. Uh, but the point being is you don't have a line in the middle that artificially limits you. It just limits you when you run out because you took too much from both sides. Of course, you have segmented memory and all that, but not on those small CPUs. So um, I had code, again, that worked perfectly fine on Teensy uh, 3.6. And when I put on ESP32, it blew up in very spectacular ways, and I could not debug it. Like The more stuff I changed, the more the bug moved, and I was like, ah, what's going on? Eventually, someone a bit smarter than me gave me the hint that, hey, you know that 12 kilobyte array, which doesn't seem like a lot, you know, 12 kilobytes is a small frame buffer that you're allocating in your function, don't do that. And I was like, hmm, okay, I moved it to global and everything worked. And I found out, well, actually the stack size for a task, because again, you're running a task on the ESP32, uh, is only eight kilobytes. So, fine. Uh, the problem is the compiler doesn't actually tell you that. 
I, like in my case, I could have known that I had 12 kilobytes. I was never going to fit in eight, but it's not configured to do that. So that's uh, an issue that could be resolved. Of course, the, the more difficult case of allocating two arrays of five kilobytes that each to, or doing stuff at runtime that's a bit harder for the compiler to see, okay, that would be hard. But it could be a little bit do, uh, doing a bit better on that. So long story short is don't use arrays of any decent size on ESP32. And that's great if you're writing your own code. It's more annoying when you're using existing code that already uses arrays, of which much Arduino code does. Um, so again, we have the big global array that can only get across so big. Um, then you have arrays and functions that you should be doing. Um, and yeah, another issue um, I found was, well, okay. So the first thing you do is, okay, you can't do arrays, you switch your arrays to mallocs, right? Um, that's fine for 1D arrays because it's just a one-to-one -one mapping with a small little caveat of size off. Size off of an array actually gives you the size of the array. Size off of a pointer to a malloc array gives you a size of a pointer, which is two bytes. Bad things happen when you do that. Um, you would know that if you wrote the code, but again, if you're converting code and it's like deep into the code that you never wrote or looked at, it takes a bit longer to find. Um, so that's a one way that you would convert an array to mallocs. Um, really, I mean, the first thing is you just define the array and you're done. The new code is you define a pointer, then you cannot do a malloc at global scope, right? You have to write, wait until the code initializes and you have, are in setup. So now you do your malloc, uh, so you have your object, size of it, you cast a pointer, then you check whether it's null, and you do something if it's null, and then, of course, you also have to initialize it. There's actually a malloc that does that, but uh, by default, I, was, I forgot that on some CPUs, it just happens to be zeros, on other ones, not so much, so then I got garbage on my screen. That's what's why. And the last line shows you how your um, multidimensional array of AB is now A multiplied by how wide it is and so forth. It's not terrible, but you have to go and find all that code and fix it, which is mildly annoying. Uh, another way with multidimensional arrays is if there's way too much code to change, um, you can do, and that's why I say, yeah, take a picture of the first slide because that's going to take a bit too long to talk, uh, talk about in details. But basically, you do, you alloc uh, the first level and then you go in each uh, slot of the first level and you do mallocs of the second level. And that way, your, uh, function, your variable bracket A, bracket B actually works. But if you do that, uh, that memory is not contiguous, which is actually good if you're fragmented, which you are on ESP32. But if you have code and then just you know, does 2D stuff and then jumps in the right place, thinking it's a, a square block of memory, well, that code doesn't work anymore. So be careful with that. Um, at the bottom, you can see how the, uh, after doing a malloc uh, cleanup, uh, I was able to save about 39 kilobytes of uh, memory um, compared to using arrays. So yeah, converting errors to malloc so the gift uh, keeps on giving. I definitely spent way too much time changing code that wasn't my own to uh, deal with that. Um, so the first thing is, again, uh, oh yeah, LED matrix was a library I was working with. Um, so it got, as it got, with the, uh, as my frame buffer got bigger, eventually it blew up, blew up for the reason I gave. So I changed it to malloc, okay. Um, then things got very interesting because it actually mallocked the memory in this constructor and the object was created at a global scope. The malloc was happening before setup time. And it's not something you really think about. I mean, it's a malloc, right? Who cares? Well, actually on ESP32 it matters because the amount of memory you have before and after setup is not the same. And you actually have more memory after setup has run or after your inside setup. So I had issues again of I have memory, but it's not there when I try to use it. And I had to modify the object that was creating that memory uh, pool at uh, object creation time to not do that. And I had to add an interface to it that says, hey, now you can please create that memory and then attach it to where it used to be before. But now I had to change the API of how that library worked. And I knew that if I send that patch to the original author, he would probably laugh at me. So I saved myself the trouble. Um, but long story short is it's 
it's complicated and slightly annoying. So um, this is what I had. So last year you saw the, what, I, well, yeah, what I had was 768 pixels. This guy is about 10 times bigger, bigger. And this one is four times bigger than this, which means 40 times bigger than the one before. Um, without going into any long details on how those guys work, and again, I mentioned they suck to drive, um, it takes a lot of effort to run that many pixels. Those are 128 times 64, and there's three of them. So this would, an ESP32 can run a single one of those, and then it runs out of DMA RAM, and it probably runs out of Steam also, because you just have to push pixels extremely quickly. And the more you have, of course, the more pixels you have to push. So that's why I realized, OK, uh, I need to get to something more beefy, which is uh, Raspberry Pi, which is hidden behind here. Uh, so I have a Raspberry Pi running this. There's a really good Raspberry Pi driver uh, that runs those guys a lot faster. Of course, the CPU has more memory, it's more capable. Um, but my code was Arduino. So that's where I wrote, and that's in all the links you can find there. Um, I wrote, well, sorry, I forked a project that allows you to compile Arduino code on a PC. That meant, on a PC, I meant Linux. Then I realized, hey, you can run that to actually compile your Arduino code on a Raspberry Pi, and then run that Arduino code on a Pi. Now, of course, all the drivers wouldn't work because it's not the same hardware at all. So I took the driver for this guy that was written in C++. I took the Arduino code that was now being compiled, and I wrote a glue driver, a frame buffer for my uh, frame buffer GFX layer that I mentioned in the second slide, I think, so that I can now generate a frame buffer in Arduino and then push it to the C++ driver that talks to this guy. And that is the, uh, the output that you get from it. Um, of course, there's native code that you can also run, so I'll actually run that right now to show you the difference. Um, let's see. Yes, thank you, understood. Uh, so that should be good here. And this will probably start a second. It will probably be running in the wrong direction. So I'll probably have to turn it this way. All the wires are stuck. Now I'm getting a miserable failure of everything collapsing in a live demo. There we go. That's the rotation in hardware, by the way. Uh, oh no! Ah! <laughs> Complete failure. <laughs> All right. We don't get more dem demo fail than that, do we? All right. Well, I was working earlier. Um, just take my my word for it. Um, so okay. So that's basically what it looks like. Um, it's able to run three different channels at the same time because it has a lot more I/O pins. And this is completely unrelated. It's a commercial for my lighting talk that I haven't heard about yet. Uh, so we can then go quickly to Q&A and coffee, which is actually right now. So get me a coffee. Thank you. Okay, it's afternoon tea time. First, though, I'd like to say thank you to John, Andy, Matt, and Mark for their presentations this afternoon. So thank you very much. <laughs>